So today's webinar is around the causes of coastal uh, erosion and it will be provided by Associate Professor David Kennedy from the University of Melbourne. And David is also a part of the National Centre for Coasts and Climate, which is managed through the University of Melbourne. David is a coastal geomorphologist with over 20 years of experience on a range of landforms from beach to coastal reefs and cliffs. He's a deputy leader investigator of the Earth Systems and Climate Change Hub Project 2.11 establishment of the National Centre for Coasts and Climate. And he's also the, the director of the Office for Environmental Programs at the University of Melbourne. His research focuses on the impact of climate and environmental change on coastal landforms using a range of techniques from real-time wave energy measurements through to unmanned aerial vehicles to stable and unstable isotope dating. And communicating of his research to managers and the public is a key aspect of David's work and involves close collaboration with government end users, coastal managers and NGOs such as the Surf Lifesaving Australia. So I might hand over now to David to get started. Thanks, David. Thank you very much, Sonia, and welcome everybody to this webinar. I have to say, unusually given a large talk from my office desk, but in, I, I hope everyone enjoys it. So what I'm going to talk today about is the causes of coastal erosion, and really thinking of something that really is a driver of a lot of newspaper articles, but really a lot of concern among the, the general public, the beach going public, but also policy makers, and then seeing what is the causes? And when we see here, such as in the background shot here at Inverloch, what are we actually seeing on the south coast of Victoria? When we see big events, and that's where a lot of the critical questions then come in terms of landform systems. We have a storm, we have impacts of that storm, but what drives it? What's happening? And how is that landform doing? What is the landform system operating? And, that, and that's very much the background of a lot of the research I do, understanding how the landforms got there and how they operate is key then to saying how will they go into the future. And just before I start, I should also thank uh, some of my partners, very much a close collaboration with uh, Deakin University, and currently a lot of research we've conducted here, including the Nest Hub through the Nas uh, National Centre for Coast and Climate, but also the Victorians DELT, the Department of Land, Water and Planning, have also provided some significant input for some of the data that I'll actually be showing you today. But of course, some of it's also supported by the Australian Research Council. But what we're looking at is erosion. We have a, a small spot down here at Inverloch, which has got a lot of local, a lot of actual statewide interest. But we're also looking at the same thing here, taken uh, well, three years ago now on the northern beaches of Sydney, with this classic shot now, which sort of comes up in many papers, many policy documents, and a lot of talks I give, but also ones I hear, of the, the, the swimming pool at Collaroy North Narrabeen Beach falling into the ocean. And this is the real image that captures that sort of public attention of going, what are we actually seeing within this environment? What is driving this? Is this something that's a product of climate change? Or is it a product of something else? Whatever's driving it, we're seeing that sand move elsewhere in that beach system. And that's really important to understand what's happening. And if you look at Collaroy here, we're standing on this area, the swimming pool's moved into the ocean. If we go back and have a look at this same beach system on the month beforehand, so with the 6th of March, we can see here's our swimming pool sitting safely up on the back of the beach system there, quite happily up outside with a nice, very nice wide beach sitting out in front of that beach system. We then go during the actual storm, and this imagery obviously uh, taken from near that, is then we can see that pool itself has now fallen into the ocean. So this is a couple of days after the storm. We can see the beach has actually receded or it's actually cut in on this stage here at the back, and there's our infrastructure now sitting in the ocean. Of course, the critical thing you might notice here is while this looks a quite a reasonably natural system once we have in the pre-storm condition, during the storm, we actually find that this beach has actually been quite heavily modified, at least in terms of its ability to adjust during storms, which is what I'll discuss a bit more on later in this uh, webinar. And we can see on the case here, we actually have seawalls to the north and we have seawalls to the south. And along this beach area where the infrastructure is, this was probably the last unarmoured section of that coastline. So the storm has come in and simply can't modify what's happening at the back where the seawalls are, and it's outflanked those seawalls and then caused the erosion we saw back on this house here. And we can see on the effect of that, which is actually just after the event on the 6th of June, the seawalls, which have now been exposed due to that event. But critically for the land system as a whole, if we move further along the same beach, 
So we're looking down here. This is from the Narrabeen end looking down. The beach erosion was happening in around here. At the northern part of this same beach, we actually have natural dunes. We don't have houses built on that, infra on that area. The infrastructure here is then built on the dunes towards the south. And we can see within here, we've had sediment movement, we've had erosion, but it's not the media worth disaster shot that we see when the houses are sitting further back. And that's a critical part when we're seeing the erosion. We're seeing sediment movement during storms. So what I'm gonna show here is another shot. If we return back to Inverloch, which is a good example, it's a nice local example for me, based at the University of Melbourne, but also there's less uh, infrastructure on this system, except for a surf club, we can see uh, in this area. So I'm gonna open up, and what we're gonna look looking at here is a fly through of this system where we've had similar type of beach erosion. We've had storms coming in along the open ocean, there's an estuary mouth at the top here, and we're now flying in, and we're gonna fly along, the edge of that surface where we've actually eroded. And we see that we've got our surf club is quite close. We're coming down on the scarp along our beach system across here. This sand that was along this section has actually now moved. And this whole spit that's actually now built up here is the material that was sitting in front of that surf club. So what we're seeing from along here, and this is a really important part, this area of sediment build out here has all accreted, has all prograded in the last five, eight years. And in fact, the section along the coast here is actually previously armoured because that was actually suffering from erosion. So what we've seen in the case of this beach system, if we go right back to the beginning, is we actually have a transfer of material from the front of the beach all the way along. There's an estuary, large estuary entrance in the case here, and that sediment has moved along. We've seen coastal recession in this part of the coastline. Well, we've actually had coastal progradation. It's actually built out over 500 metres in some sections. These lagoons are all new. This lagoon here is about five, six years old. This little small one here has formed almost in the last year. And that's a critical part when looking at coastal erosion. We're actually seeing within our erosion section, oh, sorry, I'm just returning. We're actually seeing within our erosion section we're actually seeing a transfer of sand. And that's a really critical aspect when we're looking at beach systems, is when we see coastal erosion, we're not actually losing sand. What's simply happening is the energy that's occurring at that specific spot and that specific time needs the sand to move elsewhere. So it's a redistribution of sand within our beach system. So it's not necessarily lost. We're here on Phillip Island, down on the uh, south coast, central south coast of Victoria we're seeing that sand moving. And that's probably one critical concept to sort of think about and maybe take out of this whole seminar, maybe one or two, but we'll start with one as a beginning, is erosion is not necessarily, it's not a loss of sand. It's just the sand has been transferred somewhere else. That inland migration will cause problems to infrastructure and dune systems, but the sand itself has simply been shifted. And that's what we're really interested in when looking at coastal morphology and coastal dynamics, is where has the sand gone and why? And when we think of beach systems, really we're looking at both cross-shore and long-shore movement. So in the case of uh, Inverloch, which I showed beforehand, the sand has moved in an entirely, almost entirely long-shore direction, across from the beach and round into that estuary. When we're, sit when we're also looking at beaches, we also have a major movement of sand offshore, so we can move in a longshore direction or we can move in a cross-shore direction. And that's what we're seeing with the beaches. They're constantly in adjustment to the wave energy that is occurring on that beach system. And I tend to think, I like to sort of describe beaches themselves as they're quite counterintuitive. They're loose piles of sand which are sitting in more or less the same position for a reasonable amount of period of time. There is variation between summer and winter, but your favourite beach is more or less there all the time. And that's really a critical geomorphic role it plays because it's a loose pile of sand. In this same environment, if we're to build houses, we're to build seawalls, we build infrastructure down on the beach, it constantly needs replacement. It needs to be interacted with, maintained, built up. But a natural system as a beach, it's its loose nature, allows it to stay in an incredibly high energy environment. We have a beach along this section, we have cliffs in the background. The beach itself remains more or less in the same position, but it's a constantly moving feature. 
And that's what we talk about in gene morphology. We talk about feedbacks. The interaction between the sand, the waves rolling onto our beach, they cause energy. They're an energy transfer. They move onto our sand. Sand moves off into the surf zone. It's constantly acting in a balance. And what our beaches try to do is what we describe as a negative feedback loop, is they try to counteract that energy coming in. As the energy comes in, the beaches adjust the sand to try and reduce that amount of energy. And that's that unconsolidated nature. It's because they're loose that they're actually there. And that's really the important part when we're seeing our beach systems. So what are the time scales we're looking at? What are the spatial and temporal scales? So we know beaches are loose piles of sand. They adjust, they change the wave energy that occurs. But the question really becomes is, well, what's the time frame that that's happening? How does that impact on human activities? And how will that change into the future when we have rising sea levels changing within our storm direction? Our beaches are going to adjust. So what are the time scales we're actually looking at? And that's one of the real core research problems within the geomorphology that's actually occurring is this time, space, how can we predict? How can we predict into the future? Which is a core part of the research that myself and colleagues within the NEST Pub and within our greater research partnerships are actually working on. But when we're looking at beaches, we can imagine them as a very simplified, what we call an equilibrium profile. So we have here is mean sea level. We have our beach moving down on the bottom there. And we find our beach is moving all the way down to what we say offshore, which we can say is the closure depth. So the sand potentially moves, this is the area you walk on from your sub-aerial zone, will move all the way down to your closure depth. And in Victoria, which is a quite high energy environment, this might be down to 30, 40, 50 metres depth in storm conditions. So it can occur kilometres offshore. So that's really important. So when we find we get a storm event, so we have a storm event such as this, we get a storm surge sitting on top of our storm event, or the same thing will occur under a sea level rise, we're effectively increasing the depth of wave energy off here. Increasing water depth means more wave energy can reach the beach face. So we find our beach face here, this is what we're walking on, all these people are walking. This is down on Phillip Island. This is Cape Alumni on Phillip Island. Also, obviously a lot of Victorian examples. We're seeing more wave energy hitting here. More wave energy means more sediment transport. So our beach responds. So we see we move sand from the case here, and then we move it all the way down and we move it offshore. And it moves in a series of bars, rips are really important in that sediment dynamic, but effectively the landform itself is responding to that increasing in energy by flattening out. And that's the really important part, is the beach itself, this is how what we call a morphodynamic feedback loop, is it's adjusting. So during higher energy events, our beaches flatten out. They do that to reduce that wave energy. As energy wanes, the beach is progressively steeper. So you tend to find you get flatter stones during storm events. And for that response, so we're going all the way down to closure depth. A lot of it's occurring way offshore is where our sand is actually then moving to. And the store of sand to do that is the beach face. So the bit you walk on is actually a small proportion of the entire beach system when we're looking at sandy beaches. Most of it is offshore. The area you walk on your sub aerial beach is the store of sand for these storm events. It's the store of sand for each individual wave that comes in, allowing it to move. And over the longer term with your bigger storm events, we're actually moving into the area behind our beach system. So we're moving into the dunes, the washover, those type areas, especially the dunes, the case here at Cape Alumni. We're looking at this section here. That's the store of sand for our storm events. And the case of Collaroy North Narrabeen, that's where the houses were built on. And that's what we're saying. And we can expect these areas when our fronts to be scarred on an annual basis. We see our beaches sometimes a bit narrow during winter storms, or sometimes wider during summer. But that store of sand to allow those beaches to adjust is the area you walk on. And that's a critical part. We call that the beach envelope. And that's one of the key things we sort of try and solve is going, what is the beach envelope? What is the size? What's the impact? What's the time frame of its activity? Because it does vary. And there are a lot of complications that then occur with this when we start changing the amount of sediment that's available on a given beach system. So an example I almost always use in almost every talk I give from my undergrads, it's a great example to great webinars such as this, 
is really sort of a really key data set. I'd almost say one of the key data sets globally is the work that's being done uh, from the Australian Defence Force Academy, UNSW at Canberra now, on Maruya Beach, which has been surveyed continuously since 1972. And here we are looking at beach, looking south along Maruya. Very little development, well, there's no development here, which provides us a good indication of some of the natural time frames that these beaches then operate in. So we have our big dune system along at the back, nicely vegetated. There's another dune sitting in here. And we have what we call a nice sort of fore dune, incipient fore dune, maybe a little embryo dune here coming out onto the beach. A very nice, almost sort of classic <laughs> dune succession vegetation profile. And what, what I've shown here then is just a straight drop of a large amount of data taken from uh, Bruce Tom's work at Hall in 1991. And what they've simply done here is looking at that subaerial profile. What we're quantifying here is each one of these black lines represents a single beach profile coming from the back of the beach. So we're sitting up in here, down along the beach and into the surf zone. I gather this is one of the uh, first year Defence Force Academy cadet survey trips that come down on the same section. But the great thing about this data set is they've been doing it continuously since 1972. So we have coming up, we've got over 40 years, or coming up to almost 50 years worth of data on an annual scale. And what we've got here is a big lot of black smudge. But that's great because what we're showing is each one of these is a profile. And this area here shows our level of activity of that profile. It's the profile, the beach profile envelope. So what we've quantified here is the volumes of sand, the amount of sand that that beach is moving. So this is this response. How often do we access the back of this beach system? So we can see from this beach, if we come along on this section here, we can go from about 40, so it's in 10, 50 metres there, come all the way out, over 160 metres. This beach is moving over 100 metres laterally. And this is a natural cycle, and that's what we're seeing, over 100 metres laterally. Vertically, if we say coming from here, we're about minus two, we move down, minus seven in the case there, over five, five, five plus metres vertical movement. So that is our active profile. So in other words, this whole area is part of the active beach, and that is really important. So if you look at this in terms of volume, we can immediately start saying this is a very active beach system. In the case here, we look at this profile coming up there. It's coming close, it's almost 200 metres of lateral movement. So this has given us an idea of where the active beach is, because that's what we want to know. Where is the active beach? What is it doing? If we convert these profiles then into a volume estimate, what we've got here is the beginning of the surveys in 1972, coming all the way up to 2005 when Roger McLean and Shen did this work and later. And that's, these surveys are still continuing. But critically, we're seeing the volume change. And we're seeing the volume change of this subaerial part, the volume change of the storm store of material. That's what we're actually looking at within this profile here. So as profiles building up, 1974, sudden erosion. We lost almost half that beach volume. Disappeared, went offshore. And then progressively, it about, took about nine years. So we come 75, coming up to about here. We stayed in this sort of erosion dominated period till about sort of the late 70s, 78, 79. And then the beach progressively built itself up. Only really getting back to that pre-storm period in 1983. So nine years after that original event, the sand finally came back. So this has given us an idea then, and then of what our volumes are. And we can see post that, there almost seems to be some sort of decadal level fluctuations within this profile. And superimposed on that is our normal storm. So this is our normal summer winter storms you might have in there. We're getting lots of movement within our beach profile, but that big storm in 1974 really changed it. That sand moved offshore. So if I jump back to where 1974 was, that's where it was. That line along here is the 1974 June scar. So if we were down there in 1974, that's where the waves were breaking. All this sand here has all been moved offshore and has all come back in. So we can start to say then and start estimate on this sort of 40, 50 year time scale, this is what our active beach has been. This is where, this is that store of sand. So this is obviously where not to build, but also in the same thing, if the seawall was built along here, 
1974, there's a high probability that this sand wouldn't have come back because it would have changed the morphology of that beach system. If we return back up to Sydney, we actually go to Collaroy North Narrabeen, so what that's opening slide. So this is some work that was started by uh, Sydney Uni and it's continued by uh, Ian Turner's group at the Water, uh, Water Lab of UNSW. We can actually start to say, well, is Maria just a single one-off? Is that just a natural cycle or is something on this area? How widespread are, are, are applicable are those results? Because that Maria record is, I'd say, is one of the best in the world. It's a fantastic record. It's just a global standard. So if you look here in the southern part, so this is this house section, our eroded house was just off the picture here. As a sidebar, there were actually houses all the way down along here in the 1930s and 1940s, which were resumed by the government at the time because of coastal erosion, because of wave over topping. So if you look at the profiles that we actually see on the Collaroy embayment, and these move all the way up, they were started in the mid 70s. They missed the 1974 storms. Bit unfortunate that can't do everything. But we see we have a similar pattern. There seems to be some sort of level of fluctuations there. We have changes between summer and winter profiles. And that's really important of what we're seeing. So that Maruya record we're seeing, we're seeing the same one within our beach envelope. That's our gray area along here. This is what we're seeing for how wide that beach is and how vertical it moves naturally. So the question of course comes in the next stage is we can identify where our active beach profile is. Well, that's all our active beach. I'd actually include the dunes here and would we'll probably actually be behind the seawall naturally would be part of the active beach. But the question then occurs, where is that sand going? How's it being moved around within that beach system? It's not being lost. I mean, no one got a digger in there and was removing it out. The waves are simply re redistributing it offshore and in an alongshore direction. So some of the work that's been done within there, uh, along the Collaroy and North Narrabeen, very high resolution surveys. It's now incorporated lots of aerial drone data as well. But found about just under two thirds of that variability is going on and offshore. So we're seeing sand moving down that sort of equilibrium profile, the beach is flattening out. But we also find just over a quarter of that variability is actually in a longshore direction. And in the case of this beach, it's really where in a summer and winter profile. The sand is moving both offshore, so we move along this system, and it's moving in an alongshore direction. And that's really important because structures on the beach, such as this stormwater outfall, if they were built slightly differently, can block that longshore process. And that's what we're really seeing is when we, as humans, interact with this sediment process, we remove that ability. We're sort of putting the brakes on, we're putting a harness on top of our beach's ability to adjust. And that's under current conditions without worrying about what's happening in future climate change projections we actually see. So one way to then look at it and as a global type level, or definitely an Australian national level, is to then say, okay, where is the sediment moving? And just to show the background here from to New Zealand shot, so we've got gravel beaches, but we want to know the connections. What are the connections? We know these beaches are moving offshore, but this beach in Bowman here, what's the connection between this beach and this beach, are they separate entities? Are they linked? Because we have literal drift, that longshore component will move sediment from one embayment to another. And that can be, if you lost sediment from here, you might get beach retreat, but this one might build out. If you stop the retreat, in the case on this area here, you may actually cause this to erode completely. It's the overall sediment compartments. And some of the work that Bruce Tom has been doing is really showing this through what's known as a sediment compartment approach. So what we simply start saying as we're looking at the beach system is where is that sediment actually going? We have our bucket of sand for adjusting to a storm event. What's its ability to move in and move out? And we can conceptualise this in terms of what might be a closed compartment. This might be a bit more like Maruya. The sediment moves offshore, so we get a storm event and it eventually comes back on. So here's our volume through time on the bottom here and it drops down and moves off. So our sediment moves off and comes back on. Or we might have another component, we might call it a leaky component. So in the case here, our beaches are still responding, still going like this. But a lot of them may also, a good component of that is actually moving off. It could be nourishing, it's leaking in from this embayment, but it's actually nourishing the embayment round to the next corner. 
And that's a really important part of our system. So once we identify what is our beach envelope, we then need to know is how is that envelope? Is that envelope a static feature that's just moving on and offshore? Or is it more like a river? Is it a pile of sand on the beach that's getting fed in from one direction and it's finding out on the other area? That's what we're actually seeing with our beach systems. And what's done as one level is then broken Australia up. And this is done, Bruce uh, published this in 2018 and uh, built on a lot of the work Geoscience Australia has done in terms of primary sediment compartments around Australia. And going around all Australia, going, this is your sort of sediment compartment over almost here millennial, centennial to millennial type scales. But it's a way of then saying, if you fiddle with something in one compartment, how's it linking into the next one? Which then leads me to sort of a further part of our beach systems, because what we're effectively looking at so far is really saying, what is the uh, sub-aerial component of that beach system? And this is some work uh, Daniel Lira de Connor and I did, so my uh, key collaborators down at Deakin University, looking here at beach change within the Warrnambool environment. So sort of Western Victoria, Southern coast of Australia, what we're seeing here. So what we're looking at here is imagery. So this is actually drone flown imagery of a before event. We've seen a storm here. And there is this afterwards. And we've had a storm, and this is just the normal winter storm. And we've seen that we've chopped out the front of the dune. And we can see from our dune system here, our dune has retreated, so about here, over 10 metres, in the case in this section. And in a vertical movement, we've lost sort of up to sort of five, there's four metres of vertical movement. We've shifted back a bit, but taken that sand down. That's our storm. The question then comes is, well, where is that storm gone? Where is it happening? And we can now link this offshore with some further work that we've done down there of then using high resolution multi beam data. And what we've got here is just a simple depth, depth change within this embayment within Warrnambool Harbour. So we know that we've lost that sand from the top of the beach. That is that loss that we saw there. It actually did come back later on. And we can see that distribution of material off into the near shore. So the multi-beam has got right up onto the toe. This is almost in the surf zone, right at the back of the surf zone. We're eroding that bit out. But this nice light speckling of blue is that deposition of that material further offshore. So we can start to track what's actually happening with that sand. And round in this area, this is actually the Warrnambool Harbour. I'll just move that. There's actually big sand sheets sitting off here because these compartments are most likely leaky mode compartments. The Warrnambool Harbour is likely fed from further along to the west, where the waves are coming from, and leaking round further east. And that's what we're seeing is this store of sand is possibly feeding through into that section. And that's really important that we see within these harbours, is we're linking that sub-aerial part, that store of sand, where's it actually going? Because that's what we need to know. Where's it going? How often it does? What's going to happen to it? Because that's what we're starting to see. So what, what we've got here is an example of this, of what is the boundaries of these areas. And this is one of been our focus, one of our main focuses of the Victorian Coastal Monitoring Program, sort of nested within all these other great programs, is what's happening in some of these compartments. And we have a major compartment boundary. We're down here at Wilson's Prom. Warrnambool is basically under this little dotting through here. That's where Warrnambool I was talking about. We're down here on Wilson's Prom. Uh, Maria is up around about here. And we can see as we look at a multi-beam image of the tip of Wilson's Prom, this compartment is not a closed compartment. We have a compartment boundary running straight off there, but this is a multi-beam, high-resolution, multi-sonar beam image. And we can see scour holes. So the water flow is coming from the west to the east and these large areas. So we're down to 90 metres water depth here in the pale blue coming up to, so sea level is up here in white. So this area here, for about 30 metres depth. So we're looking at 70 metres here of relief of the bed forms on the bottom. So we're, this is definitely a leaky compartment. The sand here is moving round. And we'll see this transverse ridge running across, but these scour holes down to 90 metres water depth. And this sand roaring round, the currents coming round within this area, and then scouring out towards the north. And this actually continues off round here up into the uh, Gippsland region, which I'll talk about in a few more slides. So we're seeing that this area is there. It gives us an idea of tracking where's that sand coming from? What's the sediment source? What's it doing? Where's it coming from? Where's it going to? Where did it come from in the first place? And that's really critical for then saying, what are we seeing within a lot of our areas? 
And one added complication within a lot of these areas is a lot of the models, the classic one I've shown you, the equilibrium one, it underpins a lot of engineering models. It's a very good, it's an excellent first order approximation. It's not so good when you get down to a specific site. So where I'm gonna come back down, I'll skip back down here, for those of you uh, not from Victoria who are listening, we're coming down to the mouth of the Barwon River, which is round about here on the Bellarine Peninsula. So just to give an example, this is uh, Buckley Park. So we have a dune system and the growing town of, this is uh, Ocean Grove that we're actually having sort of urban expansion down in Victoria. And if we just look at our dune system, we have dunes here, that's a store of sand. We've got sand on the beach, but we start looking in closer. So we're gonna zoom into this nice area here, coming into that spot there. We come in a bit closer, we can see our dune blowouts in there, but it looks like there's bedrock sitting in the near shore. So in an ideal sense within there, the beaches should have a lot of sand to be able to move to our storm events. But in the case of what we see is often that's not the case. Often there's not a lot. There's actually the case here. This area could actually almost be described as being sediment starved. So in terms of our resilience of the system, and that's often what we're looking at, the more sand that's available, the more it stay in its natural cycle, the more resilient it will be. In the case here for these systems, naturally, they're actually quite sensitive because they don't actually have a lot of sand. A lot of this, in the case here, this beach is more of a veneer of sand sitting on top of a rocky coast. It's quite a different geomorphic environment. Rocky coasts are erosionary. Think of the 12 apostles. This may be more akin to that than necessarily a beach, even though there's a very nice beach, which is very nice to swim on, sitting in that location. And this has been conceptualised through some of the work of uh, Jackson and Cooper with our idea of our equilibrium profile, which I showed earlier, just reversed this diagram. This is where the sand wants to go, but where there are rocky outcrops, they interfere with that process. So they can interfere through trapping the sand and maybe not come back on. Or in some cases, they could act in a positive by perching that beach system and allowing a beach to occur where it might not necessarily be. But it's important the consideration of how much sand is there, what is your active profile, how much sand is actually in there to see. And another example, so I've actually got to put a location map in this time. Uh, we're in Melbourne, so we're down at Fairhaven Beach. On the, again, more Victorian examples. But we're looking through here one of the uh, quite an old, very good data set now. It's over 10 years old. Victoria's really good at getting the uh, bathymetric LIDAR when it first came out, the laser survey. Is we're looking at, here's the Great Ocean Road, hugging itself round behind the dune system there. This is why we need to know the major assets at risk. But we start looking at the profile. Here's our beach at Fairhaven. Very nice sandy beach to walk on. But once we move further offshore, this is our surf zone. So the hummocks in here are our surf zone bars. They're in there and they've got rips coming through. The data gaps are just when there was wave breaking. But as we see, we move off down to about 10 metres water depth. We're down into bedrock. So it's actually down onto a hard bottom. So in the case of Ocean Grove, it's a veneer of sand we can see on the subaerial part, that storm surge. In the case here at Fairhaven, our veneer of sand is actually, goes down to about 10 metres. But again, it's a veneer. There's not a lot of sand there, which would suggest for these systems that they may be more sensitive. And that's what we're really looking at. In the case of Victoria, it's likely that the changing, a possible changing wave direction is going to be more important as a climate change impact than actual sea level rise. It's the waves which are going to change, cause the changes than necessarily the absolute height, at least in the medium term. And this is just not a Victorian phenomenon. So some uh, light art from uh, off uh, Wollongong, southern, uh, just south of Sydney, we can see here. I know this is Port Kemble, sorry, but we're, sat, we're in the Wollongong region. Uh, we can see that we have nice beaches along the side and headlands, but lots of rock sitting offshore. And some of the work the Office of Environmental Heritage, which has now recently changed its name, uh, has actually been starting to do this LIDAR surveys, this laser ocean surveys offshore within along the Sydney South Coast region. And we're seeing a lot of the same things there. We've got beautiful beaches and dunes, but the potential sediment source offshore is very low. And that's really important. If our beaches want to adjust to higher sea levels and they need more sand, where are they going to get the sand from? And that's what we're really looking at within these areas. So what's one way we can do? To take a, a slight sideway, is a lot of our issues we see on the beaches is we're trying to quantify 
how active is this area? What is happening with this beach system? We're at the another south coast. This is on the Great Ocean Road, coming close to the Twelve Apostles, the Air River. Is we've got our active beach. This would be an annual cycle, our incipient foredune. This could be eroded every year to 10 years. And our main foredune here, maybe every 10, 20 years, we could expect this all to be accessed, or maybe a 40 year cycle. But how can we quantify it? That's the store of sand. So what we've been doing, and this is the Victorian Coastal Monitoring Program funded through DEL, is providing people with phantom falls, which I brought one in here today. So little uh, standard ones you buy from JB Hi-Fi, they haven't sponsored us, by the way, uh, and get, giving them to citizen scientists. So the citizen scientists take the drones that we've got in this case, and they fly them across our beach surface. And what they're doing through that of flying it across the beach surface is then getting these really high resolution surveys that we actually see. So we allow them to, get, well, we provide them with the training, <laughs> they allow us to access the data, but we're really getting through this right along Victoria these levels of surveys, which we've just started in, in the last year. So to give an example of what it is, I'll show a small movie. And this is taken from one of our early setup groups within Port Ferry. We've had a very long, strong community connection to the uh, things. And maybe some of them are actually uh, great citizen scientists are actually watching online. I, I can't really tell, but hello if you are. And what we're seeing here is imagery from the drone. We're coming in, here's our dune, there's our small dune area, a bit of sand fencing there. And this is the video from that dune drone flying in along the beach system. So we can see the resolution, we come down and it's gonna change into our rendered image. So we overlay through the structure from motion, through the photogrammetry, we get down to millimeter scale surface models of these beach systems. And this is incredibly powerful that we can actually go within our beach areas and then link from those. So an illustration here, and this is what's been taken from our citizen scientists. So we can go to those areas and we can actually get very high resolution surveys within it. And what I mean, it's great engagement and it's really good for looking within these areas. But the other critical part of what we see within here is we can use this now to measure what are we actually seeing within our beach system? What is our beach envelope? So here we're now, as I've just brought up our portal where our data goes into. So we're now looking at the actual online portal where our citizen scientists upload this data, just to give you a bit of a feel and a bit of an idea for what it can actually do. So I'll just zoom out a bit just to show you where we are in the country. So for those of you not based in Victoria, now we'll just zoom in to our area. And in the process of zooming in, I will just move back out to our site. So, so here's our aerial imagery. So we can get down and start looking down at the exact scale of what we're doing. And we're down to a resolution here and we can get higher of almost individual footprints. We have ripple marks moving around behind small clumps of vegetation. And the real powerful area of this is we can actually, this is all three dimensions. So it's actually is, well, two and a half dimensions to be exact, but we actually have here, we can work out volumes along our beach system. So we can start looking at our beach and start to say, well, what is actually happening? What is the volume measurements we're actually getting along this beach area? And this uh, portal, it's a propeller portal, it's actually an Australian company developed actually for the mining industry is really powerful then to then be able to start doing quantitative measurements. So we can take within this level and we can start casting profiles. So I'm just in here in the view area and here's the cross section that we see along this spot. But what we're doing is we can see within this area, we've now been surveying this for coming up, in fact, it's over a year now, so for our first survey, is we can now can do cross sectional comparisons of then saying, what is that to the beach doing? So I've showed you already nice examples of really world-class data sets that have been done over long times. We can't go back in time, unfortunately, but we can start this off and then say, well, what are we seeing within this specific area? And we can see this in this profile, it hasn't been a huge amount of, well, it's probably been oh, 20, 40 centimetres of change within this single profile. 
And that's what we can go from there. So I will just escape out. I will uh, discard that measurement. But the other one area, as we move this back up, is we can start to then look at change. So I can then start to go through with our timeline, is then we can start to see what is the early change within this system, how we actually see this beach move through time. And this is the really powerful part, because what we're aiming to do is then start saying within this area, what is that beach envelope? We're trying to quantify that. That's the aim of this process, is then to quantify what's actually occurring and how that is then interacting with our beach system. So what some of our data have actually been showing, so we've actually started to do a preliminary run of that. We do great graphics and things, and that's all well and good, but what can we actually see? So what we're starting to show is starting to look at what is the volumetric change between this, at least on this first. So we've got a winter to a summer cycle, and we're actually going back to a winter. So we have a full annual cycle now. I mean, ideally, we keep this going for 40 years, but where can we sit? How do we nest this within the larger system that we actually see? So we've got an area here, and we can see this change of up to 0.11, 1 metres of accretion we've actually had within this beaching vein. So I'll just quickly show you all the data for all of Victoria, for all our sites. What we've actually found over, so this was the first analysis of that, of going, what are we doing from winter to a summer profile? And we're seeing in most, well, nearly all sites, except one at St Leonard's, where there's a, which is in the Port Phillip Bay, we're actually seeing accretion. So we're seeing accretion here in terms of total volume of sand on those beach systems, but we've also normalised this for small lots of beaches, because you can't really compare a small beach to an enormous beach. Two kilometres of survey to sort of 500 metres, that's not really uh, a good, good comparison. So normalising it shows we're seeing an accretion type pattern. So we're seeing the least case here of a winter to summer profile, we're seeing that sand moving back. And this is what we're aiming to do is continue this runs to start saying, well, what's actually happening as we move further forward within this system? So I'll just give a couple of case studies just to finish off. Is the question that occurs is, well, what's this doing over the longer scale within Victoria? And this is some work that's currently been uh, written up, built on from some of the great work that the uh, Delteri's lab in the Netherlands have done. Some of you may have read their automated extraction from Landsat imagery. So they did a special run for us. And this is what we're seeing along Victoria in terms of hotspots. The top spots of retreat going back to the early 1980s. And interestingly, a lot of it's quite stable, which is an interesting cop for a lot of Victoria. So intense is just the classification. I tend to avoid hyperboles myself, but that's all right. Uh, we can see where there's been accretion. We've had areas of accretion, areas where there's nothing is basically this area in here. Very little change. And we have a lot. So we actually find at the mouth of Corner Inlet there's both severe erosion and extreme accretion, if we use our hyperboles quite well. But that's a whole series, quite a unique area when we're looking at uh, big entrance barrier islands and areas like that. But that's what we're seeing with the Victoria. So actually there is erosion in areas, some spots, but we're seeing this over the larger scale, trying to nest these different scales using the latest uh, the different imagery that we actually have. To sum all this up in just a couple of case studies, and this is why I should uh, work with uh, Colin Woodroff and Murray Wallace and Tora Tamara for Geological Survey, Collins are at Wollongong, is looking at uh, Gippsland, so the Gippsland region. So what we're seeing here is areas where we get in erosion. So a nice erosion scarp. And this scarp here is quite marked because very much it's got a very deep soil profile sitting on top. So that starts to say within our geomorphic interpretations that this is actually quite an old surface. So the sand has shifted. What we're looking at is why and what time scales. It looks old. We have a very nice deep soil profile sitting on top all the way along. If I bring up the laser aerial imagery, so we're just coming across, not a perfect match, but we're basically on the same spot we can see these lines. These are the old four dunes. So these are the ones that are occurring at the back of the beach. So we're finding on those that they're orientated differently to the shoreline. They're at a different angle to the shoreline. And we actually have a look at the age. So we've done ground penetrating radar along this uh, section of coast. 
And they're very tightly clustered, these, all these four dunes, at around 2,000 years, which if we compare to the New South Wales East Coast sea level cu uh, curve, is a really tight clustering, looks like just as sea level started to fall down. So in the case here, the erosion, we're accessing those dunes, we're accessing ones that are a lot older. So this is going beyond, this could be a boundary condition change. We're starting to see the shoreline reorientate to where it was beforehand. Very important uh, comparison. If we return to Inverloch, which is where I started, we find there's actually not that much soil profile developing here. In fact, I'd say there's barely any, unless there's some soil scientists listening to me who will disagree. But we're seeing out soil profiles in the case there. And if we have a look along this section of coastline, we can actually then start to see some quite different characteristics. So this is down on this beach system. So should be seeing a nice 3D walkthrough, some photography we've got done a few years ago. That tower is no longer there, it's already gone up. But we can see our dune system along our beach area. And we can go along our beach and start moving along within our beach system. So we start to see what the morphology of these dunes happens to be. So I just jumped ahead of myself by one photo. That's all right, we'll just go down to here. Just get a nice closer look at those dune systems. So again, it's the same magnitude of scar, but when we look closer at our beach system, we can see we're lacking that sort of profile at the top. It really is very young looking sand in the case there. Maybe this isn't a long-term pattern. What are we seeing? Especially when we look at the base of this dune, we can look in here, we actually have what looks like an old ship plane, a nice little hole board in there, dug out in the case. I don't know how far that went in, it went quite a way in. It wasn't moving when I was tugging at it. But what we're seeing from that is anthropogenic evidence, evidence of people sitting, being behind, around in that system. So we can say when we're looking at this as comparing to Gippsland is, oh, excuse me, we are looking at different levels of dunes. And if we look at the LIDAR, so this is the mouth, this is our where we flew across. We are definitely having erosion. There's no doubt there's erosion in there. That sand has been transferred. If we look at the LIDAR for this section, previous aerial mapping has shown that this scoop in through here, so we're looking at about a section in there, was the shoreline in the mid 80s. We don't know what the age of this dune is, but there's still a possibility there within our section that this might not be a long term. It might be a short term, it's definitely moving, there's our channel here. Whoops, that's now full of sand, but we're seeing things on there. And that's what, and that's what we're trying to work out within these areas. So just one side to conclude, as I always say, a final word, word is don't forget population. I've only been talking about that natural human element. So physical geographer, we just move the people away. That's, that's not a reality. People love the beach. We have to be there. People live on the beach. And it's that interaction between human and natural systems, which is where erosion becomes a problem. We have natural variability. We have climate change increasing that natural variability. But there's another hockey stick, which is also important, global population. And this is, goes everywhere, within Australia, globally, but also population on the coast. And human systems are growing more and more into the current hazard zone, not even the future hazard zone, the current hazard zone, and that's a really critical management there. And an example from Inverloch, so here's our sand coming around the point in the case here, new subdivision when I was there a couple of weeks ago, built on top of the local salt marsh. We're in the hazard zone already. We don't have to worry about sea level. We need to know what it is, and that's really what's been in there. So thank you, I should, also, I should really give a special thanks to uh, Blake Allen, who's our flight controller down at Deakin University, and a great, uh, Karina Sorrell, who's our flight operator based at Melbourne. Daniel O'Connor, who's my co-leader on the drone program. This is when it was launched by the uh, Victorian Minister for the Environment. And as part of this, within the Nest Hub, we've also produced, uh, with Cathy McGuinness and with Dan from Cathy from CSIRO, we've also produced sort of almost a written version of understanding. The version of this talk is really effectively what it is. And this is in the final stage of production. We're expecting this to be sort of out there in the next couple of weeks. So hopefully that will be there for download if you want more information. So I've got some references in through here just to link into what I've talked about. And I'd like to thank you all for listening as I stare at my computer for the uh, Tuesday afternoon. Fabulous. Thanks, David. Um, that's really amazing and interesting uh, presentation.
presentation, so thank you very much. Just a reminder everyone, if you've got some questions for David, now's the time to quickly type them in the chat box. We have, a, David, a bit, a bit more of a comment. I don't know if you want to comment on the comment, but <laughs> it, it is um, A. Taylor who says he's interested to hear how the UAV elevation data is referenced spatially, in brackets CRS, especially with regard to comparison with other elevation surfaces <clears throat> like uh, AHD. Ah, brilliant question. It actually reminded me of something I didn't show in my packet of tricks. So what we've actually done with that is the drones themselves, so there are two versions. These ones here have an internal GPS, which is good for navigation, but it's not actually good for giving centimetre scale resolution on the ground. So these ones are, I think they're two grand at the shop. So we link those up with very high resolution ground control points. So normally the way it's done is using an RTK high resolution survey grade uh, point source on the ground, and we then link it into that. What we actually provide our citizen scientists with but are these what we call our smart ground control points. So these are propeller points. So they basically frisbee them, hopefully not too wildly, out along the thing. So it's made of foam, solar powered, and it's simply a wireless button, which we've got uh, there. So they turn it on. So that actually provides millimetre scale ground control. So all the flights have these across as a grid right across the whole drone areas. And then we can correct it. So we have compared these surveys to on-ground surveys using traditional surveying techniques to really ensure the accuracy. And it is sub-centimetre. We sort of say centimetre, sort of like the footprint, is really sort of the area we do for that. So we have done extensive testing that say ground control is really quite important. Interestingly, as a side, there's a new version of these ones which actually has a PPK, it's sort of a survey grade drone, a little hat that sits on top here. And that actually increases the accuracy of this significantly. So you only need one of these and one of these to do your whole survey. The one thing with the area is you've got to put the programs out along your whole survey. So overall, to give you an idea for a full kit for a survey, it's about $10,000 between the drone and all the ground control points. With the newer drones, they're about all your equipment that's in the air. So there's a bit more redundancy, but the key thing is that ground control point. So it's a really good question. Thank you. I'd forgotten I had that just on my side. No worries. So an, another question from Robert, and I might fold it into a little question I have as well. Is with the Citizen Science Drone Program, what's the sort of the overall aim? Like, what are you hoping to achieve and how long have you got? And are you going to stay in Victoria or expand? Oh, fantastic, plan? fantastic question. I suppose what we're hoping to achieve is really from a scientific, there's sort of a couple of there's a scientific viewpoint there of what, can, how can we quantify this active zone of the beach? Because we just don't know. And how's it varying in terms of volume? We can do lots of surveys, but the drone technology now in this process is just incredible. I mean, the discipline as a science is catching up to where the data is. So there's that fundamental question of where, how, what is it moving? What are the time scales? And what we're going to be doing now is some storm chasing. We're actually trying to get those big events because we know we've only been going a year. Let's try and get some big events to see what's happening. There's also a key part is that community engagement as well. We don't have the time. I mean, as, as all of us buried in email most of the time, it's not actually time to go out. So engaging with the community is a key part of that. And that's been one of the big drivers from the uh, Victorian government is getting that community input, allowing them, because all, the portal I showed with all that data, down on one side there was lots of little cross sections, that was actually our community group doing their own calculations. So they're actually able to understand their beach system and that directly feeds into the, into the policy and what they can then start to say to managers and balance that commu community demand. It's really great engagement. No, it's actually real true engagement there. We're actually collecting scientific quality data and getting the community involved at the same time. I just really see it's a win-win. In terms of processes, it's a three-year program. We're one year into it, uh, usual with budgetary cycles. At the moment, where it's, I mean, it's been, the uptake has been fantastic. We've got 14 or 15 sites. We're at capacity with our current staffing in Victoria. But we would like to, this is the kind of thing that can roll out anywhere. It really is community citizen science here. Gear is straightforward. We've got all the guides. We've developed the guides. We've had great explorations of insurance, which has been really good learning, but really positive, actually. And I'd like to see this go Australia wide. Well, I'll, I'll go crazy. But at the moment, we're, our funding limits us to Victoria on three years, but 
I'd, I'd love to see this go a lot bigger. We'd, we'd be keen to expand. Great. All right, we had a few more questions coming in. So Cam has asked, has there been any studies or modelling on the effects of mechanical beach cleaning regarding stability of sand and movement? None that I actually know of, I would say. There. Yeah, so that's one, and that's one of the things we've been looking at within the data of what are the extra things we can see within it, because we originally wanted to look at just the beaches, but that role of rack and beach rack and that area is there. Yeah, that is a very interesting and important problem there. It really would depend on where that rack is moved from. So do they actually shift the sand within that embayment or move it out? If it's staying within there, you effectively are staying within that same compartment. But if they're shifting it out, it would potentially be a loss. But I haven't seen any work myself that's been done in that area, but I think it's definitely something we're looking at exploring. Hmm, okay. We have another question from Neil who says, David, very interesting presentation. I'm concluding that property damage is mostly a planning issue, not a climate change issue or a knowledge issue. Is this conclusion correct? If so, is our planning getting better? Ah, it's, <laughs> I might just say yes. Uh, it's an interesting one in there and it really is, it's that linkage between people and the active environment. So on one level, yes, it is a planning issue. Where are we actually planning? Where are our houses to go? But also in an era of changing climates, it is also in some instances, it becomes, it really becomes a set of prioritizations, I'd say. In there. There's a lot of areas where infrastructure is in the active zone. And on a theoretical geomorphic level, well, the beach should be now, but it's not practical. It's not practical to do that. But I think it becomes a lot of areas of prioritisation. What are the assets that are, are at risk? And prioritising what is being protected. Because in a lot of cases, sure, protection has an... It's not actually necessary... It's not protecting the beach. It's protecting what's sitting behind it. And that's the critical area of there. And in some cases, we're going to have to make calls that this road is critical infrastructure for there. That is the priority. Hopefully in other areas, we can say, well, this, and this is what we're trying to... This is the active zone. Let's try and not be in that. And I think at least the Victorian government's just released a new Marine and Coastal Planning Act. And a lot of the state governments, I think governments in general, are actually recognising this and saying, where is the planning going? And actually seeing integrated stories. There's a whole story of the Coleroy North Narrabee planning story with that erosion in, impacted itself on a big planning issue. And there's whole rights there between who pays and things like that. But planning, planning it is critical. That is where we plonk ourselves as people into the active zone. Fabulous. Uh, we have a question from Tamara who says, have you looked at whether big storm events correlate with ENZO? Uh, not myself. I'm a, a climate, uh, I'm not a climate scientist. I'm looking more at the beach dynamics there. But there are predictions in there with ENSO of the storm events, especially with uh, sort of the east coast lows and the, they're expected to move south with uh, climate change and climate warming, and that's the East Australian current. So expecting that some of those East Coast lows in the New South Wales one would start to become more common. It seems like for the storm systems, at least in the Northern tropics, they'll be more intense rather than more common, but they're, critically they're reaching more south. And for the Southern part of the Victorian coast, is it's an intensification of the Southern Ocean storm belts as we sort of push the warming down, we'll probably have more wave energy coming onto Victoria and possibly the question is the angle. That's really what we're looking at. Where's the angle of wave approach? All right, and I think we've got time just to squish one last question in. Um, and it is uh, one question. What are your thoughts on efforts to revegetate dune systems? Is this worthwhile or a limit of limited value due to expectation that these areas will naturally be active? Uh, I think it's actually really important, actually. The one area, so when we access those dune systems, Vegetation on the dunes is key to keeping it there. The beach is a wave deposit. The dunes are a wind deposit. So the wind is blowing that sand from the beach into the dunes. And without vegetation, you're not going to have the dunes. So where we have areas where there's unvegetated dunes, the sand will just continue in. The vegetation acts to hold it. But what you want with the vegetation is it to be act there to trap sand, it definitely as it's blown off the beach. So it produces that, builds up that, store for the storm event but the vegetation also has to act to release it during the storm event and that's the type of vegetation that you then see so vegetating dunes is definitely a key role there for that geomorphic resilience and there's lots of other spin-off benefits even without the geomorphic side the landscape side 
the benefits for ecology and things like that are very high. So definitely a vegetative gene, preferably with natives. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, I think that means we're out of time. So thanks again, David, for your fantastic webinar. Thank and, you very much for joining. Yes, that's right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, just a reminder that we do record all our webinars and put them on the website. So this one will be on the Earth Systems and Climate Change website by the end of the week. Um, and a little plug for next week, next month's webinar. Uh, the webinar on the 20th of August will be uh, provided by Tony Rafter from the CSIRO around tropical cyclones and also a uh, portal, web portal tool on projected tropical cyclones that Tony and his team has developed. So there'll be emails going around close to the date on that webinar. And finally, if you have any questions or queries about today's uh, webinar, please contact us and um, we can hook you up with David or others in the team to answer any of your questions. So thanks again for attending the July Earth Systems and Climate Change webinar, and we hope to see you at the next webinar.